Good morning everyone. I was just saying on our Zoom message that normally we say, isn't it good after Christmas to get things back to normal? And uh, this is very much the normal for this last year, but uh, let's hope it's not the normal for this coming year. So I wanted to start with communion and uh, the reason I wanted to start with communion particularly it's a new year and it's good to um, be reminded of the symbols of communion but also there's something in the last supper that really struck me um, which I will read um, from the whole of the last supper in, in a moment and it really struck me that Jesus was about reclining and about relaxation, about coming together. Even though he knew somebody was going to betray him, it was still about that coming together as family. And we've not been able to do that in person for quite some time now. But we can do it through communion because the Holy Spirit links us all together. So I want us to recline at the table this morning and just remember who you are in Christ. So let's pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. So reading from Matthew and I'm starting um, at 26 verse 17. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, which is the Passover, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, it was while they were eating, in amongst the feasting, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to one, one, to one another, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. And Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It will be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who betrayed him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, you have said so. Imagine, imagine that moment. He was still prepared to eat and share communion, share the Last Supper with the men that loved him, had become his family, but also the man that was going to betray him and take him to the cross. So when we partake of the bread and wine, just remember, don't be the one that dips the bread in the wine at the same time. Elevate God, recognise him, but also take the bread and wine with thanksgiving. He then went on and said, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take eat this is my body and then he took the cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink from it all of you and it would have been one cup this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many 
for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The body of Christ, broken for you. Take and be thankful. The cup that represents the blood of the new covenant no longer bound by law, but set free in Jesus Christ. Drink and be grateful. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these symbols. We thank you that you are an almighty God that knew our weaknesses. And so you were prepared to come to the cross. I thank you that as we have taken in the bread and wine, it has become the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. It has become Jesus running through our veins. I just thank you that the body and blood that we have taken in has become from bread and wine to the body and the blood. Lord, I thank you that only the natural can come become supernatural in you. May the word that is given today be given to you in the natural, become supernatural through your Holy Spirit living within me. May we all be blessed by your living word today. And we ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So we are going to be doing Philippians 1, 1 and 2. And uh, you wouldn't think that I could do a preach in just two verses. I did plan to do Philippians 1, 1 to 11. But I realised that we would be here all day and I didn't think people and children could sit that long. So this is the first Sunday of the new year and that reminds me, there are two birthdays today, Sarah Lithgow and Jessica Mitchell. Fancy having a baby on your birthday. Uh, and we do wish them a happy birthday from all at the Storehouse Church, Alford. So... Let's go back again. This is the first Sunday of the new year. And we can say goodbye to 2020. But in truth, we never can. You see, 2020 will be a time remembered in history for centuries. It will go on in our history books. 2020 is not only our past, but also our future. I believe we have changed in our thinking and in our priorities. And for many, prayers and our relationship with God has become more important during this time. Why? Because we've never seen suffering in, a, in this way. To start the year, I want us to look at the book of Philippians. And it's said to be one of the joyful letters written in the, one of the most joyful letters written in the, um, in the Bible. It's a personal letter to the church of Philippi. And the book is believed, at, the book I believe, sorry I'm getting my words mixed up today. You can tell I've not done it for a few weeks. The book I believe really will define our steps as the Storehouse Church Alford in this coming year. It is stirred and stirred in my heart and I couldn't let it go. And then when I read it again, there's so much in there for us as a church and a, a young church under my um, leadership. 
this book will define the steps and I believe it will bring joy, hope and expectation. The Church of Philippi was born in a Roman colony and the Romans had seen this area as a real influential area, as a thoroughfare for, for people travelling from Asia to Europe and Europe to Asia and it would bring big business to the area. This area was to be significant to God also, <clears throat> to move the gospel to all nations. <clears throat> The church of Philippi was young because we read about it in Acts 16 and it started with a group of women that prayed by the river led by Lydia. We know that Paul had been stopped preaching the word in Asia by the Holy Spirit and was told in a dream to go to Macedonia which is now known as Northern Greece. The church was started because Paul didn't stop moving. Listen to this, guys. Paul didn't stop moving. Even though doors were stopped, were, were closed to him, he didn't sit and sulk and say, oh, I thought I was supposed to go there. He still continued to move. He didn't become stagnant. I think sometimes we wait too long waiting for God to tell us what to do or where to go or what he wants us to do but actually what he wants us to do is keep moving not become stagnant. Martin and I sat in, a, in our last church believing we were called to be pastors <clears throat> and it didn't happen until, until we moved out of where we were, where we'd become comfortable. And it really was the next day after we'd left that I got the offer of Alford. Alford, as I've said before, was sold to me as an area of deprivation and poverty. And yet when I arrived, I saw it through God's eyes and I saw it as an area of prosperity, of openness to, the, to, to God, an openness to the gospel. And what else? Alford links other areas. It's a thoroughfare to move from one area to another. People have to go through Alford to get to other places. Just the same as Philippi. And yes, there are needs in Alford and we all know that. But no need is too big for God. No need. He's, he's here. He's moving in this area at this time for a reason and a purpose. I believe this is God's harvest field for us and it is ready for harvesting. I believe God wants to manifest his power through his workers in this town. Do you know what guys, that's us. That's us, it's St Wilfred's and it's the Methodists working together to reach all the people of Alford because the harvest field is ready and we're being asked to step into the field. Paul didn't become static and ex expect people to come to him. We, as I've said already, became, have become too static. We have been sat still in 2020 and I believe the word for 2021 is move. We need to move. To get active again, to move with our from our comfortable homes and out into the streets. It doesn't mean we have to preach and sing. We just have to be present. Don't break COVID rules, but lockdown, listen to me guys, Lockdown doesn't mean shutdown of the Bible. You see, we've been walking around with it like this for too long. Lockdown doesn't mean shut down the gospel. It means open it up. It's time to open the gospel. Know it, understand it, live it, drink it. So that when you're in those situations, you can speak it out. 
without having to preach. You can do it in your everyday language. This is a living word that is for us today to use. And we must not become stagnant and make this stale. You see, people that don't know the Bible think it's an old history book and it's stale. We're the ones that have to show them it's alive. It's alive and it's, it's for now. It isn't a history book. It's a book of the future. It's a book that tells us the way to go. And I'm excited for going through the book of Philippians and just reinvigorating ourselves to who God is. To who God is in this. Last year, we have had to reset. Reset our relationship with Jesus. Reset our minds and what we think church is. Reset our minds to bring about unity. Reset our ideas and vision to be in line with God's. This year, 2021, as I've already said, we are called to move, to reach our community. And it was said at our prayer and praise that the harvest is ready and the gate is opening and we need to walk into it. Get off your seats and become active. I was watching the Joe Wicks yesterday, watching it, I didn't do it. And he's an exercise man. And I said to Martin, do you know you can sit and watch all the exercise programmes you want, but until you get up and exercise, you're not doing anything. We can sit and listen to preachers, we can listen to things online, but until we get active, it ain't going to do anything. We need to live it. We need to stop worrying about getting it wrong or doing the wrong thing. That isn't what God's about. He'll help us if we get it wrong. He'll pick us up if we fall. I once heard at a Global Leaders Summit that some of the greatest companies have made the biggest mistakes, and I mean millions of pounds of mistakes. We learn by our mistakes and move forward. If you don't make mistakes, you've never moved. The church in Philippi started, as we've seen in Acts 16, with a woman, Lydia. She was a businesswoman of upper class, which is very unusual during that time, and possibly the slave girl who was a clairvoyant, and a middle-aged Roman jailer, bringing together a mixture of social class, gender and intellect. God makes the unexpected happen through those whose society would not put together. The letter to the Philippians is thought to have been written by Paul during his house arrest and it's described by Luke in Acts 28. When looking at the letter to the Philippian church, the opening verses state who the letter is from. Philippians 1.1 states, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. So the letter is from Paul. For those who don't know, Paul was formerly known as Saul of Tarsus and he's known to persecute Christians. And then he was converted on the road to Damascus and he became an apostle of the gospel and his name was changed to Paul. Paul includes Timothy in the letter. Paul met Timothy in Lystra. As told in the start, start of Acts 16, Timothy, his mother was Jewish and a believer, and his father was Greek. And he was greatly respected by his community. Timothy was to minister to the church on behalf of Paul, who we know was imprisoned at this point. Paul is introducing him, showing that he respects him, making them aware of him for the future ministry that Timothy is going to be involved in. 
What I like about the name of the sender is it's at the top of the letter. And I, and I tried to do it today, but I don't have a stamp to do a, a seal. So I put, me, um, I put my wax on it, but actually it didn't seal because I hadn't got a stamp. But it was a scroll and when it came, they opened up the seal and then they started to read. And it said who was at the top. I love that idea because when you think about it, you know immediately who the letter's from. And uh, quite often, if you've had a long letter and it starts off, especially if it's challenging, I always go down to the bottom and see who it's from to see if it's worthy of, uh, of reading it in the or what context I need to read it in. So let me just get rid of all the uh, wax. So everyone knows with a scroll who has written the letter and we know it was Paul and Timothy. The partnership between these two men is a perfect example of God connecting people together who you would least expect. Paul was strong, an independent man. He was used to being alone and he is partnered with a timid, shy young man, Timothy. We know he had problems with his stomach because it talks about taking a little wine for his stomach and frequent illnesses in 1 Timothy 5, 23. So both Paul and Timothy were to be involved in the ministry of this church. I think it's important that no ministry sits on the responsibility of one person. I once heard said that a ministry or business is only as good as it is when the leader is not there. If they are not there and a ministry fails, then faith has been put into the one person, not to the ministry. You need to make sure you are constantly growing teams that function as such. All ministry is for God, not for man. The opening few verses of the letter is a perfect example how we as Christians should make an ordinary greeting into something extraordinary. Because after the names are given, it then states their credentials. They are servants of Christ. They are writing with humility, but also authority. If Nigel Collins was to write as a letter, he is a director of ground level for this area and pastor of Hope House. And if he sent us a letter stating, this is from Nigel, a servant of Christ, we would know that the message he was going to give would be with humility, but also the authority that has been given to him. Paul and Timothy are honourable men being used by God as servants for his purpose, for his people who can be respected and trusted. We should all respect people appointed by God. Paul then goes on to state who the letter is written to. In the King James Version it says to all the state saints and in the NIV it says God's holy people. Really both sayings mean the same in this context. The letter is written to the people who are living according to the riches given to them in Christ. And because they've accepted Christ as Lord, they are God's holy people or God's servants. Now a saint means someone who is different from other people because they are separated to God. They belong to God, a child of of God. I think we need sometimes to, to just get this into our head, that we need to know who we are in God, not to get big-headed or conceited, but so that we can try and live up to the title we have had placed upon our lives. We are holy and we are saints in Christ Jesus. Now we need to display it. I found being a nurse a lot easier when I put a uniform on. But also I realised very quickly 
that it was more than a uniform. It was a title. It said who I was. And I worked hard to live up to that title. I had been given it, I had earned it. And I wanted to honour the profession. I wanted to be, honour the, the team that I was part of. How much more should we want to live up to the spiritual title of holy child of God? We should want to do that far more than any title of this world. The letter is addressed to all God's holy people and to the elders and deacons or overseers, which suggests that the church has grown from those few people. And verse 2 is the opening greeting. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace go hand in hand and it is through the grace of God we receive the peace in all circumstances. It is grace that we don't deserve but that is given freely. Jews, when they met one another, and I think they still do it in some areas, they would exchange the word shalom, which really means peace and harmony. So they're saying, be in harmony with yourself, with others and with God. And that will bring health, happiness and holiness. But Paul knew that to receive true shalom, that true harmony, you needed something else. And that was something that is given freely to us. And that is grace given by God. We have to show God's grace to one another to receive the total peace. We don't deserve God's grace, yet we have received it. We can be very quick to judge one another and not show grace. However, God will help us if we turn it over to him. See, God knows that we'll have relationships we'll struggle with. But we shouldn't struggle. We should hand it to him and let him deal with it. He loved us so much. We need to do the same to others. Paul, in his opening statement, is delivering so many messages of joy, hope, love and grace. We too need to express the grace and peace to those we meet. We want to invite them to receive the God-given grace that is on offer to us all. In these first few verses that Paul wrote to the Philippians, he sets an example of how we should communicate in our community with each other and with others has shown a degree of recognition of who we are in God, who others are in our fellowship, who they are to God, and how to express our love of God and allow it to spill out into the community. Every Christian has been given God-given authority. However, we need to communicate with humility, and spread grace and peace at all times. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, over the last year you've shown us how powerful our words can be and how damaging they can be. But you've also shown us how your word can heal every pain, heal every hurt. I pray that we will learn how to communicate with each other, how to communicate with you, and how to communicate with our community through humility, but a God-given authority, with grace and peace. We don't deserve any. But as we enter into 2021, may we break down barriers that have been put up by man. 
may you break them down through the spiritual movement of your Holy Spirit through our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. See you all, uh, I think it's Tom on Tuesday, and uh, we have a prayer meeting again on Wednesday evening via Zoom. See you all.